You know, we need to love the sinner and hate the sin, right? Um, and there's certainly a, a certain amount of truth to that statement. Um, but then the question is, well, how do we separate the two out? Like, how do we do that? You know, we live in a world that, um, you know, if we say that we hate a sin in a person's life, they quickly say, no, no, what that means is you hate me. And so how do we deal with that in our, in our present uh, culture? You know, the, the world around us would say, you know, that if you hate me, you hate, you know, if you hate my sin, you hate me. So how do I hate the evil in the midst of a society that says everyone's basically okay? Now, hate is a big word, right? And yet sometimes hate is used in order to uh, emphasize the opposite of hate. Okay? When Jesus said, uh, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and his wife and his children and his brothers and sisters and even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. What does he mean? Does he mean that we're supposed to hate our family? Or is he making an emphasis about how much we love him? How much we are devoted to him? And also when he says things like, you cannot serve two masters for either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will despise the one and be devoted to the other. You can't, you can't have it both ways. And so sometimes when we talk about hate, what we're talking about is an absolute devotion to God. And we do know that we should hate sin. But of course, the question becomes, well, how do we separate the two out? We live in a society that says, you know, we ought to love everyone, and everyone is basically good, and yet we know that people's lifestyle doesn't match up with what God says is right. And so how, how do we go ahead and hate that? Now, you're going to hate me for this, but we're going to leave that question to the end, okay? We're actually in the Psalms, right? And so one of the Psalms that we, was put on the board several times was Psalm 139. But at the end of that Psalm, we're going to come back to this topic of hate. And David is going to talk about his hatred for those who are his enemies and those who are, he sees them as being really enemies of God, okay? And so this is important, but I just wanted to, you know, start out with what we're going to end up with and recognize that, you know, in this Psalm from David, 139, um, we don't, uh, I'll go ahead and put it up there so you can see what's, you remember where it is. We don't particularly know the exact circumstances of this Psalm, but what we do understand is that Somebody seems to be accusing David. If you look towards the end, like somebody's out to accuse him, and he wants to be made right before God. He wants things to be sorted out. Uh, and so, you know, we get to the end, and it's, it, verse 22, it says he hates them. He hates them, but his reason for hating them is because they're enemies of God, and, and they're hurting God. And so, therefore, even though they may be against him, he really sees it as them hurting me is actually hurting God because they're wicked. They're out for blood. They're, they use his name maliciously. And so this is where this comes from for him. Uh, we're going to come back to that hate. But first of all, uh, this psalm, it, it sort of splits up in very nice, nice and neatly into four little sections, six verses each. And so the first section, uh, we'll go ahead and read it, verse 1 to 6. Remember, uh, David is looking for some sort of way that it can be proved that he's all right that even though his accusers are saying whatever they're saying against him, we don't know the context, but whatever it is, that he's all right. He says this, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. In regard to David's cry for vindication, he is depending on God, that God knows him. Like he knows that he's really made, as if we want to use our psalm from last week, he's made the Lord his dwelling place, that his trust is in God. He knows that God knows that. And so, God, you know me. You know everything about me. You know my thoughts, you know, my, you know the words before they come off my, out of my mouth. You know everything about me. And so if anybody can vindicate David, it certainly is, has to be the Lord because he knows David's heart. And certainly on a, on a, in a 
one of the things that we learn throughout the psalm is a lot of things about God. One of the things is that God knows. God knows everything. And we could take that and say, well, God is, so what does that mean? Om, omniscient, right? That's the word, omniscient, means God knows everything. He knows there's nothing that he doesn't know. And we could go and say, okay, well, that's, that's a really neat concept. But like David, we should make it personal as well, should we not? Shouldn't it be our words that we say, you know, like, yeah, the Lord knows me, knows you, personally. Which means what? He knows my daily habits. He knows the thoughts of my heart. He knows the words before they even come out of my mouth. And it, because we belong to Jesus Christ, there's a certain confidence that we have that He encircles us. He's before us. He's in front of us. And He lays His hand of blessing upon us because He knows that we belong to Him in Christ Jesus. But then, sometimes when you think about God knowing you in, in such an intimate way, every detail, like there's a lot of uh, synonymous words that he uses here to, to say no. He says like he discerns my heart. He's acquainted with my habits. Some other translations, he perceives, he understands, he's familiar with, he examines, he observes. He knows every single little detail. That's my own uh, version. He knows every single little detail of our lives, of your life. Okay, just let that sink in for a minute. God knows every single little detail of your life. Are you happy to let God see those details of your life? Well, whether we're happy or not, He sees them. He's all-knowing. And there might be this tendency, if you're like me, sometimes you're like, ah, I wish God didn't know about this, but God knows it. And we might, like, we might be like Adam and Eve. Remember in Adam and Eve in the garden when they sin and they realize that they're, they're, they're ashamed because of their nakedness and they've gone against God. And so what are they trying to do? They're trying to hide. Sometimes we might feel that way, but the reality is we know we really can't hide. And so that's what David says next. He realizes that there's no place to hide from God. The next few verses, verse 7 it says, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, the place of the dead, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark with you. And the night is bright as the day. For darkness is as light with you. We sometimes may want to try to get away from God, try to hide from Him, but the reality is His presence is always there with us. He is omniscient and omnipresent, right? He's everywhere. There's nowhere you can go from God's presence. But once again, as we understand this concept of who God is, the character of God, this is not just some sort of abstract idea. This is stuff, something for each one of us personally as well. And so we realize, you know, you realize, I realize that the Lord is with me personally. Wherever I am, his hand leads me and holds me, his right hand. Like that seems to, that's talking about his strength. His strength is with me and holding me. He is a light, my light in the darkness. At first, David's words might seem like he's trying to get away from God. He even uses the word flee from his presence. But we quickly realize that, that God is a leading hand for David. He's the strength that holds him. He's his light even when he's covered in darkness. From a New Testament perspective, Lord is not only with us leading our hand, but he's with us inside of us, that he dwells within us. We have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, we have been crucified with Christ, and so we have crucified those habits that maybe are not good habits. And we've crucified those unwholesome thoughts that we sometimes have, and we've, those careless words that come out of our mouth, they, that's all been crucified. And yet I know we all say, like, what did... I think uh, Sebastian was telling the truth. Well, it was true for Sebastian, but it wasn't for me, right, Sebastian? I, I think we sing every, sing every, sin every day? Oh, well, I don't know, I think that's right, isn't it? If we understand what sin is, 
that we do sin every day. We do struggle with these things, but our com the commitment of our soul in Christ Jesus is that God has taken care of that through Jesus Christ. And he continues to work on us to change us, to be more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the way Paul says it, I think would be our words as well, right? I have crucified, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives where? Out there someplace? In me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. A key verse I had my son Joshua memorize when he was a kid um, was Joshua 1.9. Whoops, I almost, felt, I almost lost my balance. That would have been memorable. Uh, of course, Joshua 1.9, his name is what, Joshua? So it seems like a good one, right? But it's really a good verse. And in this particular verse, Joshua 1.9, anybody know it? People know it, right? You know it. A lot of you probably know it. Or if you, as soon as you hear it, you'll know it, right? When God uh, commands Joshua, he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's true. That's, that was true for Joshua, but that's true for us today. That's especially true for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not only He is with us, sort of around us, uh, before and behind, but He's in us. He lives in us. As we continue to fight the battles with our bad habits, with our sinful thoughts, with improper intentions sometimes, the Lord is with us to give us victory. We recognize that we are saved by grace, that God, this is God's gift to us, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death, but what the free gift of God is, eternal life. So by grace we're saved, but not only that, we stand in this grace. We live in this grace today, so even though we know we have this saving grace, we have a living grace which says that we can go, out and go ahead and come before the throne of God with confidence, knowing that He will forgive us, He will give mercy to us, and that he will, we will find grace to help us in time of need. That grace will help us. God promises it. As Christians, we don't really need to be worrying about whether you know, we have sin that is God doesn't like. God doesn't like any sin. But he loves you and I. He wants us to come and confess it. He wants to forgive us. He wants to give us the strength to overcome it the next time. After all, who is he? Did he not make us? Did he not create each one of us? Is he not all-powerful? That's the next part of the verse. Verse 13 for you formed my inward parts, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is your sum of them! If I could count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Uh, some of you put, several of you put Psalm 139 on the board, but you also added the verse 13, or 13 and 14. Certainly 14 is very familiar with most of us, right? I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And those are wonderful, it's a wonderful idea to think about that and to think about it on a personal level again. Certainly we know God made all people, but you know his prize uh, creation, it wasn't the grass. Grass is nice. And pretty flowers. I love it at this time of year. Our neighbors across the road, they do a great job. They look at our house and they think, oh, ugh. But we look over at them and think, oh, that's beautiful. Look at all those beautiful flowers coming up. But what God created that's most incredible is actually you. Each one of us. And we could get to talking about, you know, 
the intricacies of how God formed us even before we were seen in that unseen place. And we could talk about how God, you know, the, the incredible, all-powerful God, right? Omnipotent, all-powerful, that's our God as well, in His creative works. But do you realize that in Christ Jesus there's something even better than the physical things that God created? That from a New Testament perspective, that we are now a new creation in Christ Jesus? That in His, in his great wisdom, recognizing that we are a sinful people and needed a Savior, that He gave us a Savior and made us new again. The Lord's creative power is at work within each one of us, within me, within you. I am His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This does not by any means diminish His incredible power over the, over the seen world, but we recognize that there is also an unseen world and that he's given, he's put within each one of us a soul that lives forever, an unseen soul. It's the essence of who we are. And in that unseen place, he's created us a new person. We are spiritual in Christ Jesus and we have the spirit of God at work in us. One of the things that's pretty incredible uh, is this, he, he's reiterating this idea of God's presence everywhere. Verse 18, he says, I awake and I am still with you. On the one hand, it's great. Every morning we wake up, and who's still with us? The Lord's still with us. And if you don't do this, here's a little, it's a tiny little thing. Here's a challenge for you. If you don't already do this, do this. It's, it's going to take you, what, 20 seconds? When you wake up in bed, maybe even before you get out of bed, because, you know, and if you're one of those people that really has trouble getting out of bed, it should be no problem for you to spend some time in bed doing this. Uh, but thank God for a new day. Thank Him for being with you right now at this moment in this day. And pray for His strength and His courage this day to live like Christ Jesus would have you to live. That's a little, if you don't do that, it's pretty simple, right? Are you going to remember? Anybody going to remember? Come on. Three people are going to remember. Oh, my goodness. Well, you can go back and watch the sermon later, okay, and... But here on the other hand, as David had already said before, he said, whether I send to a heaven or my make my bed in Sheol, which is the place of the dead, it's a, it's a parallelism. He's basically saying, even if, it's, if I'm finished with this life, and I awake, he's still with me. Even in death, he's still with me. I love the way Jesus talks about this when he sees Martha after Lazarus' death, right? And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, do you believe this? We believe this. Do we believe this? Amen? That in Christ Jesus, even if I awake after I'm dead, who's there with me? Well, I'm with Jesus. Paul said, what is, it's, it's, it's for me to gain as Christ and to die, what is it? For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Yeah, that, yeah, you know, I just needed that little, switch it around, man, you got to get it right. Yeah. To die as gain, why? Because I'm actually with Christ. Where I'm living now, I'm all about Christ. That's, who, that's what I'm all about. But when I die, you know, every day when I wake up, Lord, you're with me, I know you're with me. Give me the strength to live for you today. But if I happen to wake up and I'm dead... Lord, you're with me. How great is this? God wants us to live Jesus Christ every single day of our lives. He wants us to love like Jesus loved. And shall I even say he wants us to hate even as Jesus hated? I think, wait a minute, aren't we... Christians, aren't we supposed to love? Yeah. But maybe there's something that we're supposed to hate as well. And sometimes we need to work harder on that part because we don't hate it enough. So we come to the last few verses. Verse 19. 
He's pretty passionate about this. You can feel the passion in David's voice. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. But it's not just about them. He realizes, okay, something might not always be right in him as well. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Hate is a strong word. We know we should hate sin. And maybe there's a place to hate people that are sinners. Is that possible? Well, maybe at least their ways, right? When, um, I forget which verse it is, or which uh, church it is, in Revelation, when Jesus says, you hate the, the works of the Nicolone. It's the works of them, right? It's not them, but it's their ways. David gets pretty specific. He says, like, I hate them, I hate them. And, and, but the reality is, let me ask you this. When Jesus comes in his glory with his angels, and like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, separates the righteous from the unrighteous, and the righteous go on the right, and the unrighteous are on the left, and he calls the righteous then to an eternal life. What happens to the people that are unrighteous? Jesus said they go away to eternal punishment. Why? Why do they go away to eternal punishment? It's because they sinned against God, isn't it? So, but let me ask you, is it the sin that's judged? Or is it the sinner? It's the sinner, right? And so, the reality is that, although, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fine line there or something, but the reality is that sin is terrible. It separates us from God. We should hate it with the greatest hatred that we can possibly have. Paul, when he talks about it in Romans 12, he uses, my version says he, he uses, it words, uses the word we don't use that often, abhor it. He's trying to say, hate it with the greatest hatred you can possibly find. I think one of our most, at least personally, I'll talk about for myself for personal, one of the most difficult things that I face is the fact that I don't hate sin enough. If I hated it, then it wouldn't be a problem anymore, right? If I hated it with, with all the hatred that I possibly could have, then it wouldn't be a problem. David, apparently, his hatred toward these people, it's directly connected to his devotion and his love for God. Did you notice that? The reality is he realizes that these people, he sees them and they're, they're his enemies, but he says, no, no you're, they're your enemies, God. They're rising up against you. They're in rebellion against you, and, and they're hurting you. And that's, because they're hurting you, it hurts me. And so when we see people around us that are living in sin, do we say, oh, well, that's okay. You know, that, that's fine that they're living in sin. Because after all, we just want to love those people, right? Yeah, we need to love those people. But that doesn't make their way okay. It hurts God. So how do I do this? How do I hate the evil in the midst of society that says everyone is basically okay? Well, we need to love God. Maybe it's a little bit like Jesus. Do you ever see hatred coming out of Jesus? You say, oh, I don't think so. Well, maybe. Well. Let me ask you, was Jesus ever upset with sinful practices? Absolutely. You probably think about the, de uh, the temple scene. There might have been more than one, but there's at least one for sure. And he has a zeal for his God. He, he, this is supposed to be a house of prayer, and this is the way it's designed. This is God's plan, and we're going against God. It hurts God that you've turned this into a marketplace. And he gets passionate. He gets angry. It looks like anger to me, but it's righteous indignation against what's happening to God. 
And he is devoted to God, his Father, and so therefore he is moved in spirit. He's moved so much that he's overturning tables and driving out the... Like, he's driving them out. Now, I don't know if I'm going to give you the answer you're looking for particularly. And it's a, it's a hard topic. Because, yeah, we need to love the sinner. But we need to be careful that we just don't buy into the way the world sees things. That the world says, you know, if you... Um, Everybody is basically okay. You know, people have different lifestyles, and you just need to accept that, have a different lifestyle. I don't accept it. God doesn't accept it. Does that mean we don't love those people? Well, the world would say, that means you don't love me. Are we going to listen to the world? Or are we going to have the compassion of Christ Jesus our Lord? Um, Paul says, I think it's in Philippians, this just came to my mind, but Paul says, you know, like, he says, oh, I forget what he says. It came to my mind and it went away again. I guess it wasn't meant to be said. The point is, you know, we realize that we live in a world that has a different standard than the one that we live by in Christ Jesus. And maybe for us personally, we need to remember a few things about the characteristics of God. Remember that He knows everything. So there's nothing we can hide from Him. We shouldn't, there's no use in hiding anything. Just confess it to Him. He's a loving Father. He wants to take us in. He wants to help us out. And it's not like we can get away from Him. He's everywhere present, but He's most especially present in us. But the question is whether or not we listen to His presence within us. If we follow His lead within us. We also recognize that he is all-powerful, that he is um, omnipotent. But you know that power, that same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is alive in you and I as well. And it gives us the, the grace to overcome the things that we struggle with each day. And so within our own lives, yeah, we, have to, we need to hate the sin. But we need to hate the sin that's in the world around us as well. And not just sort of say, well okay, certain lifestyles, it's just their choice. The world says it's just a choice. If someone chooses to against God, is it against God? Is it sin? Um, you may or may not be agreeing with the things that I'm saying right now. But hear the word of God. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The Pharisees, they're all upset. Oh, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. But Jesus was eating with tax collectors and sinners not to join with them in their sinful practices because the people that were tax collectors and sinners realize is that this is maybe a hope for me to get out of the trap, that, the enslavement of, that I'm in right now. And so it's great if we have the people around us in the world that are living in different ways than they ought to live, recognizing that they have a need for a Savior. And that's where we want to be able to engage with them. I'm not saying we should go out there and preach against everybody that's uh, um, living a way that's wrong, but we can live, just simply say the truth. Simply say the truth and love them. Love them with the love of Christ Jesus. I find myself babbling at this point, so let's pray. Lord God, as we come before you now, I just pray that... Um, you will imprint in our hearts the, the love of Christ, the love of Christ for those around us. Help us to recognize that we are yours, that we are your ambassadors, that we are representative of you. And so sin in the world isn't okay. We need to hate the sin in the world, but also love the sinners. Help us to find the right balance to recognize that just because the world says certain things are, are not sin, or that if we don't like sin, that uh, we are haters. Help us to hold fast to what we know is true, to be devoted to you in everything. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in this place. Sometimes we do, we, we struggle with difficult situations, Lord, and we just pray that you'll give us wisdom in those places, give us the right words, and let us be uh, lights in your world. Pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.